if you are a subscriber of this channel, you are probably a fan of Haskell. And if you're anything like me, you're also a fan of Python. Well, one of the more interesting aspects of Haskell is its lazy evaluation, meaning that values are only evaluated once they are needed and not evaluated before, thus saving us some time if we have a value that we never evaluate. Lazy evaluation also enables us to have infinite data structures. Those data structures could theoretically grow into an infinite size, yet they never do because they are lazily evaluated. For those reasons, lazy evaluation is pretty interesting, yet most programming languages out there are strictly evaluated, so the opposite of lazy evaluation. The functional programming language OCaml has a feature that lets you manually do lazy evaluation on certain calls to certain functions even though the language itself is strictly evaluated. A special function called lazy is used in order to wrap around a function that should be lazily called. And that lazy function then returns some object that we will talk about in a second, which then has to be forced. We cannot use this value, we have to force its evaluation beforehand. The important thing is that this value is unevaluated, so we never did the actual computation. So it is lazy. The question of the hour is, is this sort of behavior possible in Python? In order for us to answer that question, we first have to understand that functions are just values. So, for example, we could take a function like f and store it in g. Furthermore, we could use this function as a parameter for another function. Those two things will be very important in a second. It is also important to understand how lambda expressions work. They are basically another way of defining functions within Python. In other languages we might call them anonymous functions because they themselves have no name. They are a quick and easy way of writing new, smaller functions that simply have some return value and have no real control flow. Since we now know that we can store functions in data structures, we should think about how to store arguments. Funnily enough, arguments in Python are nothing but tuples, which can be accessed with a special star expression. When we want to achieve lazy evaluation, we have to store the function as well as its arguments that later need to be applied to the function. So we could do that in a data structure like a tuple. In this demonstration, I will call the tuple a thunk, since that is the terminology that Haskell uses. With the star expression, it is then possible to call that stored function with the stored arguments. Thus, we could write a special function that then applies this thunk, meaning it evaluates the deferred computation, which is lazy evaluation. Luckily, we do not have to use tuples for this. We can use objects. So we will create a new lazy class. That class will save the function, its arguments, and whether it has been executed already and the computed value. So we are simply caching the result of this function. Then we define a force method that actually forces the evaluation of the function and its arguments. Based on that definition, we can define a new function called lazy, which will take some function or value and produce the lazy object from it. When calling the lazy function with just one argument, that means that whatever this argument is has no additional arguments. So we simply have to return it when we want to force this thunk. So that means that the lazy object created from it simply uses the identity function and we can already force it because there is nothing to compute here. If there are more arguments, then we assume that the first argument was a function. So we create a lazy object from it with its arguments. The force function then checks if it actually encountered a lazy object. If not, we simply return it and if so, we force it. Let's look at the lazy function in action. When we define a function like the add function, we can create a thunk from it with 
the lazy function. Thus we have some lazy object that at first has no value but after it has been forced once it does have a value. Now it's important to know that when having side effects like for example trying to set the main thread to sleep for a certain amount of time this does not happen at the point when the thunk is created. Of course we need some computation we need some evaluation for that to happen. So it is very important to note that when using lazy evaluation we should not and basically cannot use side effects since the order in which these side effects will happen is not guaranteed anymore. One problem we have not addressed so far is the occurrence of lazy objects as arguments for our lazy functions. If that happens we have to force the arguments manually. On the one hand that is actually a nice feature because it lets us control precisely when values have to be forced. But most of the time we actually do not want to do that. The forcing itself should be automatic. So let's do some changes to our class. At first we will create the binary method. The binary method takes some function which is binary and some other value and then force the other value as well as our own value and then use the binary function on these values. Based on that we can actually override the binary operators for Python objects. After that is finished we can also do the same for unary functions that only work on our object itself. The only exceptions that we have to make here are the bool and the string conversion functions since they have to return bools and strings at runtime. Otherwise the program will crash. So that is a point where we have to do the forcing and cannot let the functions be lazily evaluated. Since that is the important point here. The binary and unary function wrappers create lazy functions. They do not force the values right at the point where we apply them. But they build a recursive forcing that is only done once the whole term needs to be evaluated. We also override the representation method so that we have a cleaner way of printing our internal values for our lazy objects. This enables us to build some algebraic terms that actually are lazily evaluated. As we can see here C and D do not get evaluated until we force the evaluation of D. Let's look at conditionals. So basically a lazy if. Well it's nothing fancy. It is just a lambda expression where we force the conditional variable and then basically do our choice there. The lazy if function will then create a new lazy object that will hold the result of this condition. Now it's very important to see that we have to have a true and a false branch. It is not possible to not have a result since a false always needs to have some return value. Now let's look at a practical example. We will write the factorial function in this lazily evaluated style. Yet we will create two versions and the differences between them are very important. The first version descends recursively and creates more and more lazy objects. The second version defers this recursive call and does it lazily. The difference here of course is that the first function builds the whole lazy term right when we call it. But the second function only produces this term once we force it. From the outside both functions are the same. They create a lazy object which has not been evaluated yet. Yet if we set the recursion limit manually we can see that the first version actually cannot construct its term while the second version can. Again the difference being that the first version creates the whole lazy term when the function is called and the second version defers that and does it lazily. Now let's look at an example where lazy evaluation actually comes in handy. Here we define a function that just takes a while to compute. It's not really relevant what this function does. Now the immediate advantage is that if we want to call this function we would normally need to wait for the result to be computed. And with lazy evaluation we don't have to do that. 
this is very helpful if we want to create a whole list with results of this function, but only need some of the results and not all of them. Then we can still build the whole list, which now contains lazy evaluated terms, and we can force those that we actually need. Okay, okay. That was a lot on lazy evaluation. But now I want to answer the question how we can work with infinitely large lists. Because for that we actually do not need the functions and objects we have created so far. We can use something called generators. A function you might have seen before which is very similar to generators is the enumerate function. The enumerate function returns an enumerate object. This object will produce new elements which you can access with the next function. This behavior is very similar to generators. But how do you define a generator? Well, you basically define a function, but instead of using return, you use yield. Yield will create the next value and then just continue with the control flow. So you could have a while loop, for example, and then yield some value. And that value gets returned on the call of next. But the generator will know at which point of the control flow it actually is and continue from there once we do the next call to next. So what if our control flow in our generator is never ending and there is never an end to what we're yielding? Well, in that case, we have an infinite iterable, something which we can iterate on infinitely often. And that means that we can produce a list that is actually never ending. Of course, we cannot instantiate a real list from this generator since it is never ending, but we can produce an object which behaves like an infinite list. So let's create some generators that will help us to work with infinite lists. The first one is LGen. LGen takes two functions, f and step, and a starting value. The stepping function should make the new step in the values that we want to create, and f is the function to compute the new value based on that n where we are right now. Then we define generators for mapping, filtering, and taking a finite amount of values from a generator. It's important to note that map, filter, and take are themselves generators. Those are not just single functions. So everything we do, every lazily evaluated list, is a generator. Because that is what generators are. They are some list, some iterable, that is lazily being produced and lazily being evaluated. Now it is time to create an example. G in this case will be the natural numbers. The function that we use in order to create the final value is just the identity and the stepping function is just incrementing. Then we create a mapping that squares every number and then we create a filter that just returns the even numbers. When trying to evaluate these generators, we have to see that each of them is their own unique generator. They have their own unique control flow. They are not just one object that we have somehow combined. Let's go further in our example and let's take the first 10 elements of our F generator. Now, since this generator will only have 10 elements, we can create a finite list from it. But a problem arises once we try to take 10 values again. So normally you would think that taking 10 values off of the same list would produce the same elements again, since the list hasn't changed, right? Well, that is not true for Python generators. They change because they cannot revert to their starting value. We would need to reinitialize the generator in order for that to happen. So the generators, also the generators like G and M in this case, are at a certain point in their control flow and they do not revert. So if we now take another 10 elements from it, then we have the problem that we are taking 10 values after the values that have already been produced and consumed. Another problem is that if we have this take generator, it can only create a list from the elements 
once because again the generator has some control flow and after it has produced the last element it simply returns it's done it's finished so creating a list from this generator twice will create an empty list and the problems don't really stop there lazy evaluation is not the same as strict evaluation in a language like python so we have to be very careful when trying to implement it in general we cannot use side effects as part of our programming so this means that basically input output and object orientation are not possible anymore when we use lazy evaluation of course, we could use lazy evaluation for pure parts of our code, meaning parts of our code that do not have side effects, and then use just strict evaluation for the rest. We could do that, of course. And the list example with many results from a slow function are one of those examples where lazy evaluation can be used. Another thing that we have not really discussed explicitly is that the implementation we have seen in this video uses memoization. We are caching the computed result of our lazy evaluation. That of course only works if we do not have side effects. But since this sort of sharing of results and values is one of the key improvements that you can do to lazy evaluation, I wanted to show that in the implementation in Python. If you are interested in more discussion on evaluation strategies, I'd recommend my video on strictness in Haskell. Also, maybe the videos on DeepSec and the weak hat normal form. They all discuss evaluation strategies and those evaluation strategies, of course, are not unique to Haskell. They can appear in any language. The method we have seen with Python in order to implement thunks and lazy evaluation can be used in other languages too. The only capability that a language needs is some way of storing functions and their arguments. If you can do that, you can implement this kind of lazy evaluation. So, for example, this can work in Java too. Of course, we have to do some type juggling and it doesn't look that great, but it works. If you want to play with the code for yourself, I have linked to it in the description of this video. Also, if there are any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. I'd love to discuss this sort of lazy evaluation and non-strict evaluation in Python. And as always, thanks for watching. You wouldn't believe how many coffees I run through making one of these videos. If you'd like to support them, you can do so on Ko-fi, where you can, well, buy me a coffee. Any support is greatly appreciated. Thank you.